Uh, so Annette runs a big agency that serves a lot of people with disabilities and she serves them in the way that we've been talking about So I'm not going to take up any of her shortened time I'm going to turn this over to her and she'll tell you about herself and her organization. Okay. Hi everyone. Good afternoon I'm really happy to be here and be back in Israel I look around the room and I see so many familiar faces from the last time I spoke with you We're very happy to be here happy to hear about the progress being made. And I can't tell you how happy we are to know that your government is working with the providers and with the advocates to make the systems change. So I'm hoping we can share our experiences and you can learn from some of the mistakes we made along the way and definitely see some of the progress we made so that you'll know all the work you're doing and the struggles about change, because change is difficult, right? Uh, it'll all be worth it in the end. As Nancy mentioned, uh, my agency serves 4,500 people uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We also serve uh, children uh, with a variety of disabilities, including autism. And we serve adults with uh, psychiatric and behavioral health diagnosis or mental illness. So um, I, I wear a few hats. One of them is I work for the Center for Self-Determination. Uh, the term self-determination we use to refer to individual budgeting. Right? Um, so it's about promoting person-centered planning, self-directed lives, and individual budgets. Mostly what I'm going to talk about today, though, is the agency that I run. Uh, it's called Community Living Services, and it'd be the equivalent of what you would refer to as an NGO. Um, and I run our Oakland County Division, but as I mentioned, we're a very, very large organization. Our Wayne Division was started uh, 40 years ago when we were closing a major institution. So that's how our agency started, and then we've continued to grow and grow through the years. And I'll talk about the changes that we made. I come from Michigan in the United States, and there's a lot of things we're really proud of. And one of them is we made person-centered planning part of our law in 1996. So we've been at it for 20 years. And as I talk, some people say, well, you make it sound so easy. And you got to remember, we were going through this time of change 20 years ago. I remember being a young social worker saying, oh, this sounds so you know, individualized. And I remember our budget and finance people thinking, if you let people self-direct and have individual budgets, they're going to cost more money, lots and lots of money. And I'm here to tell you, uh, person-centered planning is really about helping the person have the life they want. But it's not an empty checkbook, right? We're not just saying, you get everything, we're going to pay for it. It's about bringing people together to come up with a plan that makes sense and have people have a great life. So person-centered planning for 20 years, and we started self-determination or self-directed supports and individual budgeting in 1997. Can you slow down? <laughs> I'm a fast talker, and I'm really excited, too. So I, I'm going to slow down. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Probably the thing we're most proud of in Michigan is we have been able to close all of our institutions. Uh, and uh, that was in 2009, our very last person moved out. Some people ask, well, how did you close the institution? I'll tell you, there was uh, still 150 people living in the institution in the beginning of 2009. We got a new person working at state office, government, a government leader. And he, when he got in office, within 30 days of being in office, he announced, we're closing our state institution. You know, uh, he said, we're putting a stake in the ground. We're going 100% community. And the thing is, up until that point, everybody thought those last 150 people could not be successful in the community. A lot of them had tried and had to go back to the institution. And people said they're the toughest to serve. Uh, they're a danger to community. People won't be successful. And what that leader said is, instead of everybody talking about why those people have to stay in, once the announcement was made that the institution was closing, we had to change our conversation. How do we successfully support them in the community? And that change in conversation, instead of all of the, yeah, but they can't because, 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 became, how do we figure it out? And that, that made a big impact. We're really proud. In Michigan, we also have absolutely no waiting lists. So if somebody calls for services, they start services uh, within 28 days of that phone call. So we're really proud to be able to make this a system-wide. Uh, we serve uh, just people, um, well, the state of Michigan has about 9 million citizens. So similar in size to the country of Israel, I believe. So it's about, is it bigger? Is, yeah, I guess. Little, okay, okay. It's really about people being the captain of their own ship 
right? We all lead our own lives, and it's about regardless of whether you have a disability label or not. It's your life, and we should be listening to what you want for your life and asking you, not other people, uh, what, what should happen in your life. Or we use the term presumed competence. Now, I'm not sure uh, if that term translates well, presumed competence. Uh, it's the equivalent of like if somebody's been charged with a crime, you say they're presumed innocent, meaning we're going to assume that everybody has the ability to make decisions about their life, whether they articulate verbally or whether we have to work harder to figure out what their choices are. We're going to presume that everybody can make decisions, and that's written right into our law, presumed competent. So we know not everybody, if you ask them, what are your dreams? What do you want for the future? We'll be able to give you a list. Now, some people will. Some people have 15 pages of things they would like to do, and they've just been dying for somebody to ask them, right? But a lot of people, you have to work harder. And when people don't communicate verbally, Michael talked a lot about this. We have to rely on their communication, facial expressions, the way they communicate joy, eye gaze, signs of discomfort or frustration. We also have to talk to people who know them best. And Michael talked about how you can distinguish who knows them best, who truly knows the person. I do want to safeguard or put a warning out there, though. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, people will want to talk for the person and assume that they are the spokesperson for the person. Um, and I always say we should direct every question, every interaction to the person, regardless of how they interact or answer. Does anyone know who might be the most guilty of, of taking over? Like if you're having a planning meeting and the person with a disability is sitting there, does anyone have any guess who might be one of the number one people who might try to, we call it, hijack the meeting? I heard social worker. I heard parents, mothers, sometimes nurses, sometimes in, uh, with group homes, it might be the home manager, you know, the, the staff. Um, all well-intentioned people, right? Well-intentioned. They're used to speaking for the person. So we use some techniques and we say no matter what, no matter if I think you're going to answer me or not, I'm always going to direct the question to you. If you can't verbally answer, I'll say, look at who you would like to help you answer. And whoever you look at, I say, she would like you to say, you know. So we're trying to make sure the person is directing who's speaking, who's giving input, even if they can't give input themselves. And that starts right from the beginning of the meeting. When it comes to introductions, I'll say, Sally, why don't you look at who you would like to introduce themselves first? And then whoever you look at, she would like you to introduce her, you know. And it's making the person direct their meeting in whatever way they can. So our agency adopted this philosophy. And I will say, part of our systems change, the toughest part was changing the culture. We were used to the social worker, the nurses, the staff, the home manager. If people lived with parents or had family very involved, we were used to mom and dad speaking 100% for the person. So we had to do a lot of modeling, examples, and say, we are going to focus on Johnny, and Johnny's going to direct this meeting and tell us who he would like to speak by who he looks at, who he gestures at. We had to change the way we ran meetings, where we had to bring more pictures and visual cues. We found out things that the person likes, and then we put pictures of it. And we said, Johnny, what would you like to talk about first? And if he grabbed the picture of the swimming pool, Johnny would like to talk about swimming so that the person can direct their meeting in whatever way they can. Now, we didn't always run our meetings that way, so it was a major change for us to operate in a whole new way. The Leadership Institute, I was a graduate of the Leadership Institute um, myself at the University of Delaware, and the one thing that I came away with is part of being a leader, I'm the director of an agency, is you have to have a vision for the future, right? We've been talking a lot about the vision. I think Israel has a fantastic vision and everybody uh, seems to be clear on what direction you want to go. You have to know why you're making the decisions you're making, and different agencies and places make decisions differently. I think being transparent. Are you making the decisions because you're trying to achieve cost savings? You know, if so, let's be honest about that. Um, that, that certain models can result in cost. Is it because of impact in the person's life, life outcomes? Is it because you want to be more progressive and leading edge? Let's talk about the reasons why we're making changes. And then you have to figure out how to share that vision with the stakeholders. So I heard a lot of questions, and even yesterday when we talked, how are we going to get the staff to believe this is the right thing? How are we going to get the parents to believe this is the right thing? How are we going to get the people with disabilities to believe this is the right thing? 
change is hard for everybody. And I think getting the success stories and sharing the success stories is the key. Because ultimately what you're trying to accomplish is you would like to be the change that you would like to see in the world. And that's what we're trying to do. So we learned a lot from our past. Uh, we had 40,000 people living in our state institutions in Michigan. And we learned having people with disabilities all in a congregate setting, lots of people with disabilities did not produce the outcomes, you know, the quality of life. Uh, that we wanted to see. So we also learned, because we used to think people had to earn the right to move into the community, right? We started with institutions, and then group homes, and then maybe a provider-run apartment, and then we said maybe you'd be worthy to get your own apartment and sign your own lease and have it be your place. Or even with day programs or jobs, you kind of had to go from maybe institution to a day center, and then you're going to learn a bunch of skills, and then maybe we'll try to get you a job in the community. But what we decided and learned along the way is if you know the community inclusion piece is where you want to be, and you want people to work, and you want people to live in supported housing where it's their place, go right there. Wherever they're starting from, we don't have to take these steps along the way, right? So that was an example of what we took centuries uh, to try and transition people. And when we were closing the institution, we put everybody into six-bed group homes. And then we had to take another 20 years to transition people out of the six-bed group homes into their own apartments. And it took a long time. So if you know what the vision is of where you're trying to go, just know you don't have to follow all the steps that other places did along the way. You can aim right for community. So I'm the director of our Oakland County Division, uh, which started later. Uh, we've been going uh, 12 years now. And what we decided is we had no buildings. We started fresh in a new area in Michigan. And we said, we're not going to build any buildings. We call it the bricks and mortar. We're not going to put up the bricks. We're not going to build the day programs. We're not going to build the group homes. We're going to help people transition into the community, whether they're moving out of mom and dad's house, whether they're coming out of an institution, whether they're coming out of a group home everybody's going to move into the community. We also said, where people spend their day. We're not going to have people go to a building to spend their day. Uh, because just like the rest of us, uh, you don't get jobs by going to a building. You get jobs by being employed, right? So we're going to seek employment for every person. And some people can easily get a career, like Liz talked about. Some people prefer to get a job. I mean, she talked about food, filth, and flowers. And some people would love to work with flowers every day. Um, and then other people aren't going to be that good at working at a job where you have to be there Monday through Friday, 9 to noon, or whatever. People aren't going to be good. And then we do what we call helping people start businesses. So I'll share examples of the businesses that we have helped people start. But it takes um, part of our culture shift was believing in income generation for everybody. Regardless of level of disability, we feel every person should be aiming towards earning some income. Now, you might be thinking, everybody, that's not going to work. I'm going to share some examples because truly, every plan for everybody, 4,500 people, says we need to keep you on a path towards earning income. And I will share examples. Because the big thing we want to remember is that our purpose is that people have the same basic life quality as other people. We want people with disabilities, regardless of whether it's bipolar, affective disorder, Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, whatever your label and your disability is, you ought to be able to have the same expectations of any adult in society and live the same kind of life as anyone in society. And when we say, OK, a good quality of life, you've got to kind of define that, because it can look different for different people. So we've adopted what we call real life quality outcomes. Now, if you look at this list, these concepts apply to anybody in society. We all want these things for ourselves, and this is how we gauge as an agency if we're successful in supporting people. Do they live in a home that they control, meaning they decide who their support providers are, who comes and goes through their front door? Are they active and contributing members of their community? Do they maintain existing relationships? Are they keeping those personal connections and belongings, making new friends, earning income, and are we helping people to stay healthy and safe? So it took some reframing. Because in the past, we used to ask people, do you want to work? Would you like to get a job? 
And then some people, if they could speak on their own, might say yes, might say no. If we spoke to their family, might say, nah, he doesn't need a job, he can't get a job. Now we ask, what kind of work would you like to do? And the difference is, we make the assumption you're an adult, you live in society, adults in society work, right? And it's a whole culture change again, because really when you start putting energy into brainstorming, and if you think every person should work, earn income, then you have to get creative. How can this person work and, and generate income? And again, I'll share some examples. So those people that can't maybe necessarily get an hourly paid job, these are examples of some income generation ideas. And these slides are in the slides that you guys will get if your email address is provided. We have people who do like lawn services, lawn mowing in the winter, they might do shoveling. Uh, we have some people uh, with more severe disabilities who might do uh, watering flowers. Now that's something that has a lot of flexibility. People who work, and I mean, if I plant flowers and I'm gone a lot, they're dead when I get home, you know, from a weekend trip. So we have some people, the simple in a job is that they go and their job is to water flowers. Simple, and it's not time regimen, you just have to get there sometime during the day. We have people who have different businesses, uh, making pottery, knitting scarves, they sell the items that they make. Um, lots of different things, uh, and like I say, these, this list is just an example. The key to how we help people figure out what kind of work might work, uh, job might work for them is we find out what like, people like to do. So whenever we start a planning process, it's always starting with interests and likes. And then we go, based on your interests and likes, what can we help you accomplish? So we focus on people's strengths, we consider what supports they need, and then we believe that they can do it, right? I think part of our job is to be the personal cheerleader for the people who invite us to be part of their circle of support, invite us to be on their planning meeting. And when I say cheerleader, I mean literally we should be celebrating their successes, rooting them on, and giving them hope, right? Hope giving is a big part of our role, is to make sure people know they have potential, we are going to help you, we want to help you get a job, we want to help you earn, you know, have a business and be successful. So I'm going to transfer now to tell you a story, um, a gentleman named Tom. Do you remember when I said uh, when our institution was closing there was 150 people who lived in the institution and Tom was one of those people? Uh, he was one of the last 150. He had tried to come out of the institution three other times and was not successful. Uh, this third time when he came out of the institution, I was brought in as a consultant because he wasn't being successful. And they said, now what are we going to do? They closed the institution. In the past, they had him in a day center. And people would push his buttons. He was a guy that got easily irritated. And when you put a whole bunch of people in a room, people figure out who's going to you know, lose. I think you, I think you guys, you know, people push their buttons and then would watch him escalate. Um, so they put him back into the, first, the day center again, and um, he's a gentleman that had been in the institution since 12 years old. He had been in three of our state institutions. Um, he was in and out of the place for the majority of his life. The, uh, one of the institutions was called Mount Pleasant Center. Uh, he never liked it there. He said people stole his stuff. He felt threatened and unsafe. Uh, he didn't like the way he was treated, told when to eat, when to go to bed. He had no freedom. And he ended up coming out April 10th, 2008. That's right as our institution was closing. He was one of that last group. So they had him back in Transitions North, which is a day center. And they called me in because he was having conflicts there and they had no institution to send him back to. So we started with person-centered planning. And this is a guy that, like I say, had anger issues. Everybody knew it, everybody who knew him. And we sat down, and the first thing we always start with is what does he like? And again, he could tell us some things he likes. A lot of times we had to rely on he'd been abandoned, no family, the staff who knew him well to tell us. So he liked animals um, and, and definitely could tell us that. He liked music, and he liked really hardcore rock and roll music, you know, <laughs> not, the, not the smooth, easy listening stuff. <laughs> he liked sports and uh, MSU football, a huge football fan. He liked March Madness and everything that had to do with football. So we came up with a schedule of saying, OK, now we know what you like, and we know you don't do well in the day center. If you are not going to go to the day center, we don't want people sitting home bored and lonely. What are you going to do during the day? So we came up with the idea of recycling. 
lots of flexibility, easy to do, and he started a recycling bin in the apartment complex where he lived. They had no recycling program. He put bins throughout every building in the complex, and he would go to the recycling center. Now, the center is one of those things that's open all week long. You can go very flexible. So if he was having a very bad day, it's not like he had to recycle at that moment. It allowed a lot of flexibility. He volunteered at the MSU horse barn so he could interact with the horses because he loved animals. He would also go to a market and buy carrots at the market to take to the horse barn, listen to music. We also had him uh, volunteer with seniors delivering Meals on Wheels. And people said, you took a guy, I don't know if I told you this, this guy had been handcuffed and hauled away because when he got angry, he would push people over in wheelchairs and he would cause a lot of chaos. They say, you had him work with frail seniors. The fact of the matter is when he was doing things purposefully, he had a reason, he was delivering lunch, he did fabulous with the seniors. He would visit and talk to them, he would interact with their cats, and people loved him because he was there for a reason. He wasn't just spending time, he had a purpose. Played lots of sports, he had various sports teams, took up biking and mall walking. He ended up losing a lot of weight because we not only focus on where people live and what they do for their job, we focus on uh, healthy living. And uh, he wanted to be a DJ, so we thought, he thought a DJ was popping CDs or tapes into a boom box because he lived in the institution his whole life. We said, no, you're going to have to learn computer skills. So we started taking him to the library where he could learn computer skills and learning about a DJ business. And then we found a DJ who was willing to mentor him. This is a gentleman with Down syndrome who has his own DJ business. And he said, yeah, let him come. He can sit with me when I do my gigs. I will teach him DJing. And he started a jewelry business. Now, this jewelry business helped him have a very purposeful reason to interact with females, to say hello to people. And he loves sports, so he made sports-based jewelry. These are just some examples, but it made him happy and it gave him something to do. And then he would sell these items at craft fairs, stores, and he not only earned money doing it, but he would go into the community consignment shops. I don't know if that term translates well, but they're shops where everybody who does crafts puts their items up for sale. So he would restock his merchandise, collect his earnings, and then, you know, it gave him purpose. And he became known in his community as Tom, the guy who makes the beautiful sports bracelets. And so these are just like, I, I put some of these slides in here just to say that he only wanted to do green and white because he only liked Michigan State. And we had to talk to him about marketing and, no, you have to change your colors. And having a business involves us helping people understand what it means to have a business. But our services became, instead of watching him and providing supervision, it became, how do we become the cheerleader for Tom's jewelry business, right? We're a number one fan, right? And that's what our job became. And he quickly became a gentleman who was not Tom, who failed and went back to the institution three times, and nobody liked him at the day program. He was constantly getting kicked out. He became Tom, the proud business owner who volunteers with horses and helps seniors get their lunch and a businessman in our community. And these kind of things um, start very simple, just with talking about what people like, and then we move on beyond what they like <laughs> to how to help people be successful. We do the same regardless of level of disability. He lives in an apartment. Yes, he has one roommate in an apartment. Yep. And he doesn't necessarily need 24-hour staff. He has people who check on him, and he has a way he has access to a 24-hour staff. So that's a difference. There are some people who constantly, constantly have staff with them. They need supervision. And we say there's a lot of people who need to be able to pick up the phone and call staff or push a button, but that doesn't mean they need to be observed at every moment. It just means if they're having difficulty, someone needs to be able to come to them. We call it access to 24-7 staff. Um, this is Jen, her business. She makes garden stones. Jen cannot move a single mu uh, muscle in her body, very spastic, cerebral palsy, and very severe cognitive impairment. She does eye gaze, and the support staff that work with her say, are we going to make a moon or are we going to make a star? And they wait for Jen to look at one. Okay, we're going to make the moon. Are we going to put red beads in or blue beads? This is how they spend their day making her merchandise, and she also sells at a market where they go and stock the shelves and things at the market. So we use the same approach. Jen can't speak to us, 
but we know that she likes beautiful things, she can choose colors. We use eye gaze to help her establish her business. When people aren't working or running their business, people volunteer. And where they volunteer is the exact same kind of places that people volunteer who do not have disabilities. So it's not like we're taking 10 people with disabilities and saying it's disability day at the farmer's market. We're saying uh, Johnny loves animals, so he's going to volunteer at the humane uh, uh, shelter, the, the animal shelter. And it's not like we call and say, Yes, I have a 38-year-old with Down syndrome, some behavioral challenges, and can he volunteer there? We don't do that. We just call and say, what would somebody do if they wanted to volunteer? When's your volunteer orientation? And we just show up, just like anyone else in the community. Um, so places people volunteer with animals, museums, libraries, churches, Meals on Wheels, food banks, cat sanctuaries, nature centers, nursing homes, zoos, homeless shelters, parks, fire and police departments, Salvation Army, child care, senior centers, anywhere in the community, people with disabilities volunteer just like the rest of society. That's kind of a standard of how we operate in general. What would the rest of society do? So again, we're starting with what people like, and we're saying how do we create a life and a day based on what people like that would be the same as anybody else in society would do? People also take classes. So these classes are not adaptive special classes. They're just regular community-based classes. And some people say, well, what about a painting class? If someone takes a painting class, depending on the level of disability, are they going to be able to paint the exact thing that the, the teacher in the class is teaching? And the fact of the matter is so many classes take artistic ability and abstract that who cares? Who cares if they're a good painter or not, right? We take classes in the community to connect and make relationships and gain skills and do things that bring us joy. So classes would be another example. This is Elizabeth. She takes a video production class, learns how to use this exact equipment that's in the room. Could she pick it all up? No. Could she pick up some of the skills? Yes. And this is what her schedule looks like. Now, I know you can't really see it, but I guess I just wanted to show you this to say, people aren't sitting home doing nothing. This kind of planning of saying, what's she going to do on Sunday? What's she going to do on Monday? What's she going to do on Tuesday? Is what the person-centered planning process is about. Now, Elizabeth's schedule looks like this. John's much simpler. John needs photos. Uh, he needs visuals. And actually, we just use this at the planning meeting to help line up his schedule. I went out two months later to take this picture, and he brought it out. And they said every day he pulls out this schedule and says, and they say, OK, what's today? Today's Wednesday. And he's pointing, oh, I'm going to the zoo today. And then I'm going to go get a coffee at McDonald's. And that, you know, so these things help people understand and be able to predict their own lives. But you notice they don't look the same. Two schedules never look the same because two lives should never look the same. Individualized planning, person-centered planning, and individual budgets. So it's about when we do these plans, balancing what the person's health and safety needs are with what their dreams and wishes are, and coming up with a combination. So I'm going to share a video with you now. This video is put out by Wayne State University. The intention is to help parents have a different vision. So this is parents speaking about their daughter, Liz. And Liz looks younger, but I'll tell you Liz is in her 30s. So this video series, and there's a whole bunch of them, and the link is in your handouts if, if these things are helpful. It, it's parents speaking. It starts with there's a, a parent, parent of a five-year-old, and then there's a parent of a teenager. And this is Liz's parent. She's 30, uh, I think she's 36 years old. But the idea is to give that vision and have the conversation, because sometimes it's hard for people to even envision something different. And the reason I like this one in particular is Liz does have very significant physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and is, uh, she can't articulate. But when you hear the video, you'll see how her parents have helped her create a life based on what she likes and, and, and can accomplish for herself. Do you know them all in person? What's that? Do you know them all in person? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she asked if I know all these people in, in person, and I do. Liz has a live-in caregiver. So she I don't know if you can see a little bit of the video as he's showing. Um, it would be difficult for her to be all by herself. But we maintain, even if somebody needs support, 
That doesn't mean it has to be paid 24 hour, any kind of specialized residential. She has a roommate who does not have a disability who lives with her. Um, and then she also has some other supports that come in and help her during the day. When Liz was born, it was like, what the heck? I mean, this can't be happening. It was, I was just, just devastated. We were going to the birthing room and everything was just gonna be so peachy and wonderful because we're gonna do all this natural childbirth stuff. And, and then she turned out to be breech. And when they did the x-ray, there was a lot of, oh my gosh, from the nurses. And so I knew a lot was going on. I walked through the doors. They pushed the bassinet with Elizabeth in front of us. It was the most powerful moment of my life. I mean, it was instant love like that. Then my husband came in and talked about how beautiful she was and how she looked just like him and how excited he was to have her. And it just totally, it, it, was, it was like this turmoil of negativity, but yet he's happy. And it's like, well, I should be happy too. But I'm so worried about this baby and whether or not this baby's gonna survive. We didn't know that she was gonna have developmental disabilities at the time, and we thought, we were hoping that she didn't. But nonetheless, we just planned that she would live to her maximum potential, whatever that would be. Just kind of went from her birth of being, you know, very devastated to that reality of, wait, I have this baby girl <laughs> that's adorable and happy and pretty easy going, that's surviving some pretty challenging therapies and, and surgeries, and now going into school and, and now looking at what education is, which is planning for your future, and then actually realizing that she is competent and has skills. We started learning about inclusion when she was like four years old. We always wanted her included. We wanted her to achieve goals. We wanted her to learn to be socially appropriate and just treated like everyone else. What we learned was that students thrived, that the community became accepting, that um, it opened doors for her as an adult because it would be relationships that would build upon her skills and her abilities and her acceptance. Liz is 31 years old. She's been living on her own for about five years. Elizabeth is the owner of this um, condo that we're at, and um, I take care of her. Liz has always had a full-time aid. Liz needs a lot of support, so she's she always has a what's called a para pro in this in the special ed programs. It's almost like a sister bond because I've been with her for so long. A lot of people think that I was like, no, we fight all the time. I'm like, sometimes she gets mad when I watch too much music videos or when I watch a movie and she doesn't want to anything that. I would do, she would do too. We go to Panera and grab a coffee and kind of socialize over there, go grocery shopping, getting things for the house. We go to Target, kind of see clothes, and we go to the mall, and we hang out with friends, have a little social gathering here, and, um, right, this is my boring you, Liz? <laughs> We have allowed Liz to take risks in her life, and because of those risks she's taken, she's done things that Chris and I will say, wow. Liz was a child when she started, so she's been with us many, many years. The benefits are huge, and there are multiples. There's exercise, recreation, social, um, interactive, there's bonding. She has progressed in her riding to that she turns her horse and she signals the leader when she needs to turn, when she wants to walk on, when she wants to go. She's um, a very opinionated young woman. She like, knows what she likes, she knows what she likes to do. Progressive and as open as I, we tried to be and our beliefs and everything, we had no idea how much she would progress, how she would grow, how she would change. She has responsibilities in the week. She has to go to work. We start off, we punch in, usually two hours a day. We really want her to be in the public's eyes. We are in charge of pricing and returning the products that people don't like. I make sure that she does the best of her ability. I don't do the job for her. I just make sure that she's there doing the best that she can do. The first thing that all parents think about, and I think particularly parents with children with disabilities, is their safety. And some parents don't let go. That's easy. Elizabeth doesn't talk. I can't let her go here. She can't go there. What happens if she falls? What happens if this happens? You know what? All those things have happened. She's not made out of China. She's a young woman, and she's fine. 
and it all has to do with the opportunities that we've given her. And we, we aren't special people. We learned things. We took the initiative to learn to find resources and to find opportunities for Liz to give her experiences and to help her grow, just like you do with any child. And other parents thought that we were just bucking the system and trying to be difficult people because we wanted inclusion and we wanted her to be self-determined and, and give her opportunities instead of just take care of her like some poor sap. And she's not a poor sap. She's a person with a lot of potential and ability and it's, all, it's paid off. Those, those videos are meant to provide vision, right? Vision. Good, thank you. Because you could see how Liz could be in a day center. You could see how Liz could be in an institution. But we want you to be able to see that Liz can live in her own place, go to a job. She's worked at that job for 15 years. 15 years, Monday through Friday, two hours a day, every day. So instead of the resources and dollars going to a building program, the resources and dollars support her to be successful in the community. So the only other example I want to share, uh, and then we'll go to questions, is I, I wanted to let you know one of the reasons why this topic is so, um, I have such a passion for it. <coughs> and uh, the reason is, and if Marsha Probst was here, she would share her story, but she's not, so she allows me to share it. And I know Marsha's story quite well, uh, as that's my little sister, Marsha. She has psychiatric diagnosis, bipolar, generalized anxiety. She also has health issues, diabetes, eating disorder. Um, uh, she, at times, was over six foot tall and weighed under 100 pounds. When she was not doing well, she had years where she was in and out of the hospital 10 times in the same year for various suicide attempts. I, I imagine if you work with people with diabetes, you know how easy it is for things to go wrong when they stop taking their medications. Not only their psychiatric medications, you stop taking your insulin, you know what's going to happen. The system was spending a lot of money on psychiatric hospitalizations, psychiatrists, therapists. Uh, they even had her placed in a, in a group home uh, with six other, other individuals with mental health diagnosis. Living in those settings did help with her medication compliance, but did not help with her quality of life or her recovery. She had uh, a roommate that committed suicide that she shared a bedroom with. And when you think about it, if you have people st struggling with their own mental health, and they're surrounded by other people who are also struggling, that may not always be the best. Through self-determination and individualized budget, we knew she needed help with medication, but we didn't feel she needed to be any kind of in a facility, a hospital, or a group home. Uh, the individual budget paid for six hours a week. So every day she had somebody that would come by for a half hour. Uh, and the purpose of that half hour visit was somebody to gauge her. How do you look regarding hygiene? Let's take a look at your medication. Do you have all your supplies? Do you need help calling the pharmacy? Uh, cognitively, she had no intellectual disability. She needed help with uh, coaching and mentoring and giving her hope that she could lead an everyday life in the community. And she went from a system and a person being supported that was costing our system hundreds of thousands of dollars in hospitalizations every year to a budget at one time which was $5,000 because it doesn't cost much for a peer, somebody, it doesn't even have to be a licensed, you know, a degree person, just somebody to help coach her on medication management and show up and care. If she wasn't looking good, somebody knew she was going through a bad spell. And I'm happy to report that uh, it led to her getting better with her own medication compliance. She now works full time, no longer on any government assistance at all, is married and owns her own home. So I know it can work, right? We're all in a time of change. I know it can work. I've seen it in my own family. And I, and I know I had to convince my own parents to let her try right? Let her try. She went from somebody that my parents could not go to dinner without fearing their daughter would commit suicide while they were gone to somebody who is happily married in her own home working full time with her own health insurance. And, and it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And that's why I talk fast and I'm overly excited and I'm overly <laughs> saying, just do it, guys. Just do it, right? Because I know you can and I know you'll get there and I can't wait to hear your successes.
All right, so let's take a couple I was going to say, I know this lady had a question right before our audio. We'll come back to your question. She was asking about the job. She said she know there was, knows there was a lot of focus on volunteering and filling the day with interest and leisure, but she wanted to make sure that, that I express to you all income generation, right? A little jingle in your pocket makes you not only happier, but remember how Michael said most people make their friends by working getting themselves out there, meeting new people, and what about the sense of accomplishment and pride, right? Uh, nobody wants to be a taker for their whole life. So the fact that people can not only give back through volunteer volunteerism, but can have a job. When you meet people, one of the first things people often say is, what do you do for a living? And what do people say who go to a day center, right? We want people to have something they can say. I own a jewelry business. I am a political analyst. I work at a flower shop. Whatever it is, people need to have a career and something that makes them proud to say what they do, what they contribute. Nobody wants to be 100% taker in life. So we got to give people opportunities, just like we all have had in our life, to try jobs and fail, right? I hate it when people say, yeah, we tried that once. It didn't work. Like we all haven't been in jobs that didn't work out, right? Everybody deserves the same opportunities. Sure. Two questions, actually. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank you. It was very, very interesting. Good, thank and you. And two questions uh, regarding the staff. Okay. Uh, first, what is the caseload that uh, your, the staff in your agency deal with? Okay. And secondly, about the uh, training. Okay. What kind of training is there? So the caseload is interesting because when you talk about the staff, we have people who have support staff that support them in their apartment. We have some people that cannot be alone for a second, and we have other people that people drop in for a half hour a day. So the staff are usually working with multiple people. If you're only dropping in to see someone for a half hour a day, you're dropping in to see a lot of people throughout your day. And other people work entire shifts with only one person. You know, full time, they're going to the same person's house. So it's a little different from like uh, filling shifts in a facility or a building because you are traveling from one person's house to another or you may, so I, the caseload, I guess I would have to understand the nature of what you were talking about more. Same with the social workers. Some social workers can just place a phone call to someone, check in with them once a month. Other social workers, and we all know this if we're social workers, goes like this, right? When they're doing great, they don't need a lot. When, like if Marsha's person who drops in on her every half hour or every half hour a day senses she's not doing well, that person's not a licensed social worker. They get on the phone and say, I think we need to talk to Marsha because she's kind of, her hygiene's not good. She doesn't seem like she might not be taking her medication. So it, it totally varies and it's all individualized. And training, the biggest training we did is on this culture of person-centeredness Right, because it's easier to put people in slots, but when you start talking about we're going to set up the services based on what this person needs, it's a whole lot of training on these concepts that we're talking about today. Getting buy-in and stakeholder. And that's why these videos, and when you guys start, you'll get your own videos and your own families that'll speak to people, you know, and, and, and it'll be things that people connect with. But uh, changing the culture of the agency is the biggest training expectation. And then it's all about cheerleading after that. To overly simplify it. It is complicated because if, you're, if you have an agency and you have staff who are used to working Monday through Friday or uh, Tuesday through, you don't work Friday, I know. Some people do, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, then you, and then now you're saying, okay, well, you have to go here for a half hour and then there for three hours and you work with this person and then this person has more problems. They need you more now and they need you less. This whole piece of staffing is a very complicated piece because what the staff need to now do is something very, very different than working the regular shift and they have to use their own cars and they have to travel from place to place and you hire people with their understanding that that's what the job is. 